Okay, I be talking uh, today about microevolution of European oaks during environmental changes. There's this uh, concern that trees may not be able to adapt to, to climate change. And this, is, this um, opinion is constantly repeated. And one of the usual arguments that is used is that the trees have so long generation that they would not be able to change uh, in enough time to adapt to environmental changes. And what I will be doing uh, today is actually to um, review what we know uh, about the past when actually natural environmental changes was going on, how the trees actually respond. This is a major source of information to understand how they may respond actually today and, and in the future. And you all know that there has been major environmental changes in the past, and I will be examining these environmental changes and also the, um, the um, consequences on, on European oaks. Yeah, Andrew asked me to, to talk, he knew about this project when he came to France, and he asked me to tell us about, to tell you about uh, uh, our, our investigations. Uh, so, well, why, why should trees be capable to adapt to uh, global change? We know that there's a major limit, which is uh, generation duration. However, trees have a major advantage uh, in comparison to other species that they are highly genetically diverse. The, the, the species, that, uh, for example, uh, Cecil Oak, is one of the shows about one of the highest genetic diversity that has been observed so far in other organisms. I, I just take this comparison, these two numbers. They just came out of the whole genome sequencing comparison between, for example, oaks and humans. If you compare the number, the uh, heterozygosity rate between this, uh, in, in these two organisms, that means the number, for example, of differences within a single uh, individual between the, the, the two chromosomes. In oaks, it would be 2%. That means that every 200 base pairs, you have a difference. If you look, you do the same thing and examine the human genome, it's one out of 1,000. So they are 20 times more diverse. So in other words, if you see two human beings, you compare two human beings, and then you compare taken randomly in a population, you take two trees taken randomly in the population, the two trees, they look almost the same, but they are 20 times more different than the, the, the two human beings. And we all know that diversity and the level of the diversity is the fuel of evolution. The more diversity there is in the population, the more they can change from one generation to the next. So, okay, generation length is very, uh, very long, but these organisms are able to change very rapidly within one single generation. So this is the basic hypothesis that we are testing here by looking at microevolutionary time scale. We want to know of a very short time scale at the evolutionary level how much actually oaks did change. Okay. Now, the usually, uh, when I'm talking about a microevolutionary time scale, I'm considering what is best known uh, 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 about microevolution. That means the, um, the changes to the, since the environmental changes since the last glacial, glacial, glacial maximum, this means about 15,000 years ago. And uh, at least in European oaks, the uh, evolutionary scenario is that. Uh, most of the, uh, in those days, most of the populations were restricted in southern Europe in some refugial areas, either Spain, Italy, and, or, or the Balkans. And then as the, as the um, climate warmed up, they migrated northwards following the climate. But they stay also in the south. And we, today we have the distribution that, that we all know. And this is well uh, illustrated here by the, um, by the distribution of, of pollen records that has been analyzed here 
based on the uh, European pollen database, you can reconstruct the distribution of oaks since the last glacial maximum. Uh, sorry. I'm not Okay. Okay, o over uh, 1,000 time scales, and and this is, and you can actually extend it. This is what is currently do, uh, done, for example, by niche modeling, in in the context of of uh, a given climatic model or greenhouse gas emission models. You can pre you can somehow predict the, this, the um, um, bioclimatic envelope that oaks would probably o occupy, for example, at the, at the end of this century, giving such scenarios. And this is sh shown here on these different figures. This is to today's distribution, and in red would be the distribution that is that the area that would not be suited anymore to, to the oaks and the green, the new areas that would be occupied in, in, the, in the frame of different scenarios that are that I shown over here. So if we had done this, the same uh, niche modeling some 15,000 years ago. Assume that some scientists, for our first humans, were able to do niche modeling. <laughs> <laughs> they would probably have predicted the oaks were over here, that the oaks would go over there. So there is a, a complete shift of distribution. But this is actually, this did not occur. We didn't have a shift. What actually occurred is that we had expansion. So population that were at the south, in most cases, were kept in the south, okay? although climate was changing. So that demonstrates, obviously, that there has been adaptation under climate change. And so what, have, uh, what kind of climate change has, in, has there been? Well, we know, of course, there was the a rapid warming since 15,000 years ago during the, the, the about five, 6,000 years, with very rapid um, warming, and then the Holocene optimum. And then, and then there was, a, during more recent period, what was called, in, at least in Europe, the Little Ice Age. Some three, 400 years ago, the climate was much cooler, and I guess what's the case also in North America. So I will ex be examining, on, and this is our purpose in our project, two time scales here. How did trees respond to the rapid warming after the last, last glacial maximum, and how actually did they respond to the uh, little warming following the little ice age? And of course, um, so, and this is done in the, the usual method that, that is uh, that we employ to study such evolutionary scenario is to compare today's population. We usually in provenance test, we actually we study um, divergence, population that resulted from a common ancestor following a given uh, evolutionary scenario. But this is not the method that we will be using here. We want to know exactly how a given population actually evolved over uh, a given time scale. This is more evolution than this is more divergent. And of course, we do this in oaks. Oaks are the ideal species to, under, to understand uh, the um, evolution, uh, microevolutionary changes because they have left, they were present in numbers and in quantities in Europe, and probably also in North America, as we know. But also, they have left lots of, of um, historical remains, either micro uh, fossils, but also macro fossils. And if we want to do this historical um, diachronic analysis over ages, we need to analyze um, macro fossils. Okay. There's another reason that oaks are interesting for this, as that is that you can, the, the, the dating of the material, you need a time scale to study evolution, and the dating is extremely precise. If you use dendroecological data, dendrochronological data, sorry, based on, on tree ring analysis, there's a, 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 a database available in Central Europe where you can identify a given macro fossil remains at a single year basis up to minus 8,000 
years before Christ. So this is ex extremely precise and makes it then much easier to, to get a precise uh, time scale. Okay, so I will be, be, be talking about two time scales, as I indicated uh, earlier. The first one is evolutionary change after the la last glacial maximum. Okay? So that period here. Okay? And then in the second step later on, I will be examining actually the, uh, uh, the uh, more recent period since the Little Ice Age. So as we want to do this um, historical analysis uh, over, over the ages, we need to access uh, foresight samples that we can precisely date to study this. So there are two kinds of material that we are using here. Either, either fossil uh, remains, we can go back actually to the time scale where we are looking at, and archaeological remains, you actually uh, material that was processed or used by humans, but they are well dated as well. And of course, they are more recent. I will be giving some examples of the kind of material we are using here for these two categories. One kind of material is um, ancient logs that usually uh, you can find along rivers and quite often in gravel pits. When there's a gravel pit that is constructed along a river, they usually discover huge logs. And these are examples found in, uh, along the, the Durance River here. These logs are 10,000 years old. Okay. Uh, this was provided by a colleague from, uh, for, from the Durance. This is in the Rhine, along the Rhine River, okay? And uh, I think they're about 7,000 years old. Uh, maybe now the ages are not here. And these were um, logs that were discovered also when, when gravel pits were, were constructed. They're usually huge, extremely, uh, as you can see. And they are, they are, they are present in, uh, actually in numbers. This is um, the, such, the position of such logs along uh, rivers in the northeastern part of France. This is the Rhine River here. This is where so you may recognize probably Strasbourg here and Luxembourg here. This is the Mosel River, the Meuse, etc. Each of the wet dog is a log that was discovered, or many of them. So this means, I didn't mention this in the introduction, of course if we want to study evolutionary rates, we need to have a population level. We don't need, we don't, and we are not looking for single uh, individuals. We want to have numbers so that we can actually see how on a population level the species has evolved. A second uh, also, uh, ancient logs, a second kind of material comes from, materi uh, from woods or wood logs that came from what is called submerged forest. This is a kind of, uh, this is a forest here called La Briere. It's uh, on the western coast in, in Britain, Brittany, in France here. And this was uh, invaded by uh, ocean, uh, Atlantic Ocean transgression about 6,000 years ago. This is to today's landscape. It's rather peat and a uh, more like uh, landscape. And when, and it's full of logs. If you, if you uh, dig into the ground, yeah, it's full of ancient logs that are, and if you extract them, this is to just did this, uh, uh, two, two technicians, uh, to, to actually three weeks ago, where they extracted with the tractors several kinds of logs that we are currently using. There's also the submerged forest along, um, along the coast, and that's quite present in, in Great Britain, along, along uh, Wales, the Wales coast. Last year, there was a very uh, a period with a very low tide and a very high tide. And at a very low tide, this is kind of picture you can, you can see. This was an ancient, the, the Atlantic Ocean was about 120 meters deeper 15,000 years ago. So there was forest along the coast. And you, when they are very, very low tide, in some cases you can, you can see this uh, submerged, remains of submerged forest. So far we didn't use material coming from here. Now, this is the material, the ancient logs. 
We have a second category of material that is indicated is archaeological material. So material that was used by humans. There's a, an immense resource of material here that comes from what is called pile dwellings. Pile dwellings are the very first constructions of humans in, um, when they settled in villages, when they became farmers. Okay. The, 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 the constructions were done along the lakes on piles, as you can see these piles over here. Okay. Since the piles, and, and most of those piles are in oak material, okay. they are uh, what is called pile dwellings or palafitic piles in, in French or in, also in, in Italian, available and present on all lakes along the, um, um, along the Alps. And they actually were classified uh, uh, three years ago uh, as an archaeological heritage. But it is a, a hidden heritage. You don't see it. It is under the water. Okay. And this is um, the distribution. You can see here the Alps. The wet spots are all the areas where you can see the uh, pile dwellings. You have pile dwellings in France, in Switzerland, in, in, in Germany, in Austria, in Slovenia. Actually, this is what is represented here. Okay. And these pile dwellings were constructed with, uh, uh, when the uh, farmers actually came from the Middle East, as shown yesterday by Beatrice, and entered Europe. Their construction where pile dwellings were constructed, constructed in, in these areas. This is the way they look. They have been, well, there's a whole database. It is, for example, these are all the piles that still exist in the Lac du Bourget, which is in the, in the, on the French Alps. And uh, archaeological scientists have very detailed description and position, GPS uh, position of each pile. Okay. And this is the way the remains that you can still, in some cases, they are much taller. Okay. So this is how, you know, if you are Population genetics, you become a scuba diver after a while. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not diving. <laughs> How deep is the water right there? No, this uh, is a few meters, uh, 10 meters or so. Less. In most cases, it's, it's very, it's not very deep. Okay. Well, there's a website. If, if you if dial uh, UNESCO heritage with uh, pile dwellings, there's a website with pictures and these are uh, pictures come by Yves Bio, which is a colleague, actually, I think it's him that collected this material to do this. Other constructions were that we are, um, for example, water wells. Okay, these are the first water wells, so, and they're very similar. Each time we find water wells, is they are constructed in a similar, a similar way. These, I think, are, I don't know, 3,000. 500 before present, or even in some cases, palisades. And this is actually when the material, this is a pile dwelling, when it was cut, okay? And this is the way it looks like. In, in some cases, it's rather, they are rather in, 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 uh, in good conditions. And so this is the basic material, actually, on which uh, we use the, um, we try to extract DNA. Now, uh, this is a more technical part. Uh, the analysis of ancient DNA coming from this uh, source of material. And this is currently conducted by Stephanie Wagner, who is a postdoc at the lab. And she's doing the work with Ludovic Orlando at the University of Copenhagen. There are very uh, uh, technical constraints. You better don't do the analysis of ancient DNA on oaks if you have a lab in a lab where you have modern DNA of oaks being analyzed. It has to be in a different building. It has to be isolated that are well, so that there is no material from modern, for example, pollen grains from modern uh, living beings coming inside that, that would be amplified and analyzed. So this is the reason, actually, we started to do it in Bordeaux, but we moved the whole thing at the University of Copenhagen where uh, there is a whole lab that is only doing analyzing ancient DNA. So this is the whole process here. Yeah, it's 
The techniques are very recently published in Natural Review Genetics by Ludovica Orlando, where you will have, you have all the details. Basically, the methods, there are different methods. Uh, well, what you, you need to know first to prevent contamination from modern DNA. So these are the first steps. So, and then you have, you have to authenticate that actually you are working of ancient DNA. Now, uh, there are some criteria when um, DNA is aging, there is some degradation in the DNA, in the structure. First of all, the, the, um, the, it's cut in very small pieces. And second, there are some specific mutation in the, uh, that uh, start to, uh, in, the, in the ancient DNA, and you can detect those mutations so you are absolutely sure that it is ancient DNA. So these are the currently the material that we are processing on a population scale. Uh, the most of them come actually from the um, from the pile dwellings. There's some other material, okay. And I will show in more details results that we have obtained. Um, this is um, a pile dwelling from uh, coming from Constance Lake in Germany, and this is a piece of wood coming from a, a, a water well, okay. So what you can see for these two samples, you have the distribution here of the, the length of the uh, DNA fragments. And you can see a peak at about 30, 40 base pair. And this is typical of ancient DNA. If it would have been the modern DNA, would have, the, the fragments would have been much larger. Okay? And second, this is the, um, the, uh, the, the frequency of peculiar mutation that occur at the extremities of these uh, fragments. In modern DNA, you would not have this. If it is ancient DNA, you have this pe pe peculiar mutation that occur in ancient DNA. So with these two, on these two samples, we are absolutely sure that this is ancient DNA. And it's actually the case in most of the samples that we have processed so far. Here are some more results. Then you sequence, actually, you extract your DNA, you construct a library, and uh, once you go to the step of authentication, um, you sequence all the fragments that you have, and you compare those sequences with the reference genome of your species you are looking at. So you can, because there are other organisms in the DNA that you extract for, for where you will have the DNA, and you have to get to, to remove and see what actually what is, the, what is your DNA you're looking at. So these were the number of reads that we obtained in the, in the two samples. These were the number of, of hits for chloroplast DNA. And this was actually just by doing the sequences, we get about tenfold the um, uh, coverage of the chloroplast genome of oaks, about sevenfold here for in these samples, which is sufficient to analyze the chloroplast DNA, ancient DNA. And this is the nuclear content. So the nuclear content in this DNA that we extract, there's only one, less than 1% that is ancient nuclear oak DNA. These figures are not too bad. For example, in humans, when they did Neanderthal, okay, it was 0.1% of Neanderthal that they extracted from the DNA that came from the bones. So, so far, um, we got a proof of con concept on lacustrine and waterlogged wood sample that the method would be working to recover and retrieve ancient DNA. We are able to identify, well, we hope to identify the chloroplast lineage to which these uh, samples belong to, to identify the species. So far, it's very difficult uh, to identify species when you have macrophocytes. We are not able to say if it's Petrea or Bua. It's very difficult to identify. Here, with the, of course, with DNA fingerprints, we will be able to, to assess for that. And we will be able, of course, and we hope to, do, to then do, to uh, estimate the evolutionary rates between the different time scales that we, we consider. OK, so this was a, for the first time scale, OK, since that, that means since the uh, last glacial maximum. But we're also trying to look at a very short time scale during the past 400 years since the last uh, little ice, well, the little ice age, 
has there been any evolutionary change in, in oaks? Okay. To do this, we don't use uh, ancient material, uh, fossil remains. We use modern material. It happens that in um, the, uh, the oak stands in France, the very um, um, well-managed oak stands are managed over extremely high, long rotation ages. In a few forests in France, there are still stands, um, again on a population level, they are more than 350 years old. Okay? So we identify the different forests where this is the case. There are three, three forests, Forêt de Troncé, Forêt de Bercé, and Forêt de Renouvaldieu. In those forests, you will find sections, compartments, where trees are, as I indicated, about 400 years old. And this is actually was due to uh, King uh, Louis XIV in the uh, early 1600s. He needed a lot of wood for, for ship construction. And the um, situation in, in, in the French forest wasn't very good, so they decided to develop an even age a structure of the stands to produce what wood for ship construction. This was done by Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was the prime minister of, of Louis XIV. So this con consisted, an uh, even age oak forest consisted to uh, produce um, natural reproduction, a pure oak forest, produce natural reproduction uh, uh, seedlings in numbers more than, in some cases, more than one million seedlings per hectare. And then natural selection is going on, and, and, uh, for, and you go, in the first 10 years, you go from one million seedlings down to 50,000 seedlings. So most, you have only 5% left here, so most of the selection is actually occurring at a very early stage. That means that the stands that today are 400 years old, they were mainly selected when they were young in their 10 early, very early uh, uh, ages, years. So in a given forest, in one of those forests as I indicated, you have an age distribution. Some, some stands are indicated by different colors here. Some stands are very old, 400 years. Some stands maybe only 100, and then the, the, the young generation. So in those three stands, the Forêt de Renovalieu, Forêt de Bercé, and the Forêt de Troncé, we selected compartments of different ages, 360, 160, 50 years, and five years. And we established common gardens coming from these four cores in different, uh, established in different, in different forests. So by comparing in a common garden experiments the material of these different cores, we will be able to see if there has been any change between the, um, uh, since the last, the little uh, ice age and, and today. Oh, this is just an example of how those very old stands look like. Now, this is one, one tree. You get, this is my, my colleague here, uh, Sylvain Delzon. And, uh, well, this is, um, and here I think you have a, the um, analysis of the tree ring of one of, of those trees coming from those very old state. So, so far we don't have any results here that I can show. Okay. Uh, now we did the last experiment also for, the, uh, for that period. There's another source of material that may allow to assess for evolutionary changes of a short time scale. This is the case of species introduction. So I come back to the US here. Northern Red Oak has been transplanted to Europe some 200 years ago. Alexis Ducousseau, a co-worker, has been doing some historical uh, analysis, and we know exactly when it was introduced, and it's widely planted in Europe, okay, since the last 200 years, okay? So what we are testing here, we want to see, so that this material comes from North America, it was planted in Europe, okay? And of course, the North American material stayed in Europe, uh, in, in North America. And today we will be co comparing these two 
material, the, mat the population that were introduced in Europe in comparison to the original, the source population. So we did this actually, uh, the first thing we would like, wanted to do is to, well, actually, where did the material come from? We didn't know where, where, where it came from. There's no document very precise that would indicate where the material was coming from. So we did the analysis with chloroplast DNA. Okay. So we found 12 different haplotypes in different populations from, from the natural distribution. We did the same thing in European population, and you find about the same haplotypes. Okay? About it distributed with the same frequencies. So we were not able to know exactly where the material came from, but at least we know that the, 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 introduced, the introduced germ plus, the introduced germ plus is a representation of the original germ plus. So we established some uh, 30 years ago. Uh, this was one of my very first experiments that established, actually. A, a comparative provenance test, a common garden experiment in which we is installed French population while European population and North American population. Now these are the results for, that we obtained, for example, for bud burst. Shown here is the, um, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, bud burst measured, assessed as a, according to a grading scheme, okay, uh, in fa as a function of latitude. So the, uh, the, the higher the score of bird burst, the um, earliest the, the population are flushing. So uh, in other words, uh, population from southern latitude, <coughs> from in the US, in the natural trend, tend to flush earlier than population from, uh, no, sorry. Population from uh, uh, southern latitude they do, tend to flush later than population from northern latitude. Okay? And that's the case also in provenance tests that I established in North America. However, the material that was in red, you have the material that, was, that is of French origin, of European origin, you can see that the, the, the pattern is completely opposite. Population coming from northern latitude in France tend to flush uh, later than the population from southern latitude. So something has happened since this population have, have been introduced. So there has been some kind of evolutionary change. We don't know what it is. Was it natural the response to natural selection? Was it some foundation effects? But anyway, there has been some changes. Okay, I think I'm a conclusion outlook. We have seen that the diachronic reconstruction of evolutionary trajectories can be done using ancient DNA. Now we try to implement the population genetic approach based on ancient DNA to, to assess what kind of um, evolutionary change that has occurred uh, along environmental change. And this is done using genomic data, but also phenotypic dissection of important adaptive traits. While this work is done within the frame of a, a, a EU research project uh, supported by the European Research Council, it's like the NSF at the European scale, it's a project called Three Peace, and there are a number of people of our lab and from other labs in, in Europe that, that work and in this project. I would like particularly thank all the uh, people from the archaeological field and that uh, provided us with material that is being analyzed currently for ancient DNA analysis. Thanks for your attention.